May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our Lord, our rock, our strength, our redeemer. Amen. Amen. It's a nice little prayer. A lot of pastors pray that prayer at the beginning of their sermons. I customarily do. It comes from the 19th Psalm, by the way. That's straight out of Scripture, from Psalm 19, word for word, right out of the Bible. So the words of my mouth, that part's kind of up to me, isn't it? The words of my mouth, uh, that's, that's my responsibility, and I guess there's not much you can do about that, because I've got a microphone. <laughs> But the other part, the meditations of our hearts, see, that's, that's plural, that's all of us, the meditations of all of our hearts. You see, we're in this together. We worship together. Even when I'm preaching, we do this together. The sermon is an act of worship. This is us giving our adoration and our attention and our time and our devotion to God. But it's not just me doing it. It's not just my words. It's the meditations and the thoughts of all of our hearts together. It's the collective motives and thoughts of our hearts together that make this worship meaningful to God. The problem is we don't always do what's meaningful and pleasing to God, do we? Sometimes the motivations of our hearts, sometimes the thoughts of our hearts are not pure. Sometimes our thoughts and our actions and the meditations of our hearts are downright disappointing to God and to ourselves, if we're honest. So here we are then gathered together as a community, as a congregation, imperfect people, sometimes with pure motivations in our hearts, sometimes not, and yet we gather together to be in God's presence. What an imperfect congregation we are. Amen. Amen. We can confess that freely, and to be quite honest, I don't think I'd rather be anywhere else than here with my church family. This past Friday was a special day um, that marked three years since the first day I came here and Matt met me in the church office and gave me a key to the building and said, good luck, God's good. <laughs> it's not quite how he said it. I think it was welcome. Uh, three years that we've been together now. It's been a, a wonderful three years, a lot of fantastic moments and a lot of fun times in ministry, and I think we have a lot more exciting things ahead of us. I believe that the most exciting things in our relationship have yet to come. Amen. Of course, relationships aren't always sunshine and roses. As with any relationship, if we're completely honest, um, the, the, the more we grow together, the more we learn about one another, and the problem with that is the more we learn about one another, the more time we spend together and the more authentic we are, the closer we get. Although, to be honest, in, in my experience, as far as pastoral ministry goes and church ministry, these past three years have been really peaceful and productive. No, main, no major conflicts, no big arguments or divisions, and so I'm convinced, truly, that no matter what lies ahead for this congregation, for us and our relationship together, I believe God will steer us through it with compassion and grace because our relationship is such that we are open and authentic with one another, and you all are a remarkably resilient congregation. Did you know that? As if you hadn't already proved that by rebuilding after a building fire, this pandemic is proving just how resilient you all are as a church. So I'm thrilled to death to be part of that, too. Relationships can be a little bit scary, though when we get to know one another. Like I said, the more we come to know one another, the more we come to know one another. The good and the bad, the good things and the flaws. Our mission trip team learned this last year. We really came to know one another on that mission trip. That happens though, when you spend every hour of the day for 12 straight days together. We learn who on the team gets cranky late in the evening when people get tired and we're ready to go to bed and that pastor says, let's gather together for an evening devotion, we learn who gets tired at night, yeah. We learn who doesn't like to get up early in the morning when the, when the breakfast for the team is served at 8 a.m. sharp. Now, for some of you, 8 a.m. is not early at all. For others, a couple on our mission trip team, 8 a.m. might as well have been 4 a.m. We also learned, I think the whole team learned, that the pastor gets rather irritable when he gets hungry. 
That happened a couple of times on the trip. Within each of us, there are unlovable parts. There are unlovable things about us. This is normal, and we all have these, and that's where we shift our focus to Moses and our reading from Exodus today. We've been talking about Moses for the last several weeks now, and Moses is often remembered as, as someone who did wonderful things for God. We remember his accolades. We remember the servanthood, the, the devotion to God, and the, the amazing things that he did, and he really did do a lot of great things for God. But Moses had an unlovable side. And it's funny that we choose to highlight someone like Moses, despite all of his flaws, and he had several. God knew that. Moses knew that. The Israelite people knew that. We remember the courage of Moses. That's how it lives in our memory, though. And when I think of Moses, I often think of somebody who resembles Charlton Heston a lot, standing in front of Pharaoh, saying boldly, you know what Moses says to Pharaoh, let my people go. In your minds, doesn't he look like Charlton Heston? <laughs> a lot. Maybe there's a coincidence there, I don't know. Let my people go. Moses, though, was not always the uh, exemplar person of character we should strive to be. Moses had killed a guy. Do you remember that? Moses committed murder, and then he hid the body, and then he lived life as a fugitive on the run to avoid being arrested for it. How's that for the meditations of our hearts, right? That's maybe not something we would want in the relationship, but it's there. It's part of who Moses is. While Moses is a fugitive running from the law, he comes across this burning bush. You remember that story? We talked about that a few weeks ago. This burning bush and, and the voice of God comes out of the burning bush and tells Moses to go back into Egypt, where he's a fugitive, to go back into Egypt and to rescue the Israelite people. And Moses says, yes, sir, I'll do everything for you, Lord. Except that's not what Moses says at all, right? Moses argues with that voice. Moses says, no, I'm not going back there. I'm not doing it, God. So the relationship between God and Moses begins with confrontation. It begins in an argument. The relationship between God and Moses is not built on peaceful adoration and respect. It's built on chaos and conflict. And the ride really just gets even more interesting from there. As far as relationships go, especially our most meaningful and authentic relationships, there are ups and there are downs, and that's normal, that's part of life. For those of you who are blessed enough to be called to the vocation of marriage, how many of you in your marriages experience every day of wonderful bliss and nothing else? Raise your hand if that's you. How come nobody has their hands up? Because we know that life is good and life is bad and marriage means we go through the good and the bad and we do that together. And that's exactly what our faith is calling us to do also. That's the image we get from Moses in Moses' relationship with God. Relationships, especially when they are authentic, when they are genuine, it means that we give our whole selves to one another. The good, the bad, the joy, the sorrows, in sickness and in health. Maybe you said that once to somebody you love dearly. We say the same sort of thing to God when we choose to follow God, and God calls us to be our true, authentic selves. I love how Moses never tried to dress himself up for church just to go pray to God. When Moses was angry, God knew it. When Moses was happy, God knew it. When Moses was feeling betrayed or alone, God knew it. God knew everything there was to know about Moses, and it deepened their relationship between, between God and Moses because Moses was willing to be his true, authentic self to God. And that's a lesson for us, I think, to be authentic, to be genuine in our relationships with each other and with God. Then Moses gets real authentic. In our reading last week, we talked about this. Moses had been on this mountain retreat with God. They had been sharing words back and forth, having a wonderful time. And then you remember the story, they get word that down below the Israelite people had cast an image of a golden calf and were bowing down to worship that golden calf. Oh my goodness, Moses gets angry. Does Moses ever get angry? Moses gets so angry that he storms down the mountain and starts breaking stuff and smashing stuff around and he screams at the people. And God had given Moses this tablet, we call it the Ten Commandments, it was probably sapphire actually, biblical scholars say, but 
this tablet that had the words of God etched on it. That's a wonderful thing. I think if God ever handed me something personally, I would tuck it away and guard it with my life. Moses takes that tablet with the Ten Commandments and smashes it onto the ground because he's so angry at the Israelite people. That follows what happened last week in our reading when they cast the golden calf. Moses is not afraid to be his authentic self, even when he's angry, even when he's upset. And you know Moses must have been upset to go and smash something that God had given him. God's not happy with the Israelites either, by the way. Remember in our talk last week, God wants to rain down his wrath on the Israelite people, and Moses is the one that says, no, 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 Lord, that's not how you want to be remembered. And I think in Moses' mind, he's saying, I'll deal with them myself. <laughs> that's what happens, you know. And that's where we join the story in today's reading. Scripture tells us that Moses went down the mountain, he pitched his tent outside of the Israelite camp, and he and God weren't done with each other. Moses talks to God face to face, is what our scripture reading says, which is a very polite way of saying, Moses said, Lord, we need to get some things straight right now. That's sort of the tone I imagine Moses using in, in our scripture reading in this prayer today. And some people say it's sacrilegious or dishonorable to speak to God in such a tone. I say there is no more authentic prayer a person can pray than a prayer that comes from the heart. Even if your heart is angry, even if it's upset, if you're feeling depressed, if you're feeling lonely, pray that. Offer that to God, because the more authentic we are with God, I think the more authentic God is with us. That's what deepens the relationship. Moses is angry. He's angry at the Israelite people. He's angry at the situation he's in. He's probably a little bit angry at himself for the way he smashed those Ten Commandments. I'd be angry at myself for that. He's probably angry at God for leading him into this mess to begin with. And Moses isn't afraid to pray that anger. So Moses says to God, Lord, you've given me a job to do. You haven't even given me anybody to help along the way. I don't have anybody supporting me or encouraging me in this. Do you really expect me to do this alone, Lord? These are your people after all, Lord. That's how our reading starts today. And God could have thrown off the gloves and gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with Moses and said, you want to go? Let's go. <laughs> I mean, really, just go back to Genesis and ask Jacob how he got that hip injury, right? God's been known to wrestle. He'll, he'll, he'll wrestle, yeah. But instead, God says to Moses, I am with you. I'm with you, my presence is with you, and I will give you rest. You have to trust that. Moses is still boiling in rage, saying, you know what, Lord, that's not good enough. I need your physical presence. I want to see your face, face to face, Lord. God says, I will give you some assurance, but you're asking for things that you can't ask for right now. Moses wants to deepen that relationship. He wants to grow closer to God, and honestly, that's not a bad thing. Don't we all desire to be closer to God? Amen. That's a good thing. We should want that. We should want a more authentic and real relationship with God, and if you have ever found yourself in a moment in life where you're saying, Lord, I sure could use some assurance that you are with me right now, you're not alone, because this goes all the way back to Moses, asking for the very same thing. Near the end of our reading today, Moses wants to see the glory of God. That's Moses saying, I want to see the plans. I want to see the blueprints. I want to see what you're up to. I want to see behind the curtain, so to speak. And God says, no, you can't do that. You can't see my face. Theologically, the word that we use for that is transcendence. Transcendence means that there is far more to God than we will ever be able to comprehend. Even if God gives us a little glimpse behind the curtain from time to time to see what God is up to, we will never be able to fully know and understand the mind of the Creator. That's just not possible. God didn't design it that way. So we have this humbling reality where we have to realize, despite our close relationship, we are not equals with God. And I think that's the real lesson that Moses is struggling with here. Moses wants to grow closer to God. He wants to be on the same page with God. He wants to see what God has in store. And I think in his own heart, Moses wants to know that he's not abandoned by God. But the way it comes off is that Moses wants to be on the same level as God regarding what God's plan is, what God's knowledge is, what God foresees in the future. 
And God has to remind Moses, I'm the creator, you're the created. I will not leave you, I will not abandon you, I am with you, but there are things that you don't know and that you won't know. And so what this story serves to remind us today is that even as we are our true, authentic selves in our relationships with one another and with God, our relationships with God and our relationships with one another are built on this authenticity, this ability to be genuine and to not conceal parts of ourselves that we would rather conceal. God already knows our whole selves. God already knows everything there is to know about us. It's our quest to find out more about God. God already knows everything about us, so our lives are spent now trying to discover as much as we can about the Lord. And what we know from God and what Moses learns from God is even though we may never see his face, we may never see the blueprints, we may never know what God is up to fully, yet we know God's goodness and mercy. God says, that's how you'll know me. That's the, that's the hallmark by which you will recognize me. My goodness and my mercy are with you. And when we pause long enough to really think about that, we don't know what God has in store for tomorrow. We don't know what God's plans are for next week. We don't know exactly how God's gonna get us through this pandemic in the same way that Moses and the Israelites weren't quite sure how God was going to get them through the Exodus. But God has proved over and over again that his goodness and mercy will sustain us. They will get us through, they are with us. Those are the characteristics of God that are made most known to us, his goodness and mercy. And together with one another in relationship, we can be in relationship with God and we can give our whole selves to God knowing that he is with us, his glory is upon us. One of the hardest things to accept, I think, as a follower of Christ is that we may never know the why, we may never know the when, but we know that God is guiding us through these unknowns. That's what Moses has to come to terms with today. Moses has to realize that we can be assured of God's presence even in times of chaos, even in times of uncertainty, even when things are unknown, we can be assured that God is with us because God gives us just a glimpse. God always gives us just enough of a glimpse to calm our nerves, to calm our anxieties, and to comfort us. That's goodness and mercy in action. So for today, and for every day, as we celebrate past accomplishments, as we look forward to the future that lies ahead, as we anticipate things to come, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. And may your presence continue to be with us and just as Moses knew you, authentically knew you, Lord, may you always be known by goodness and mercy, and may you continue to remind us that you are indeed among us. Amen. Amen.